My psychologist friend relayed an interesting anecdote to me. Recently, he's been trying to teach his wife how to drive. Having grown up in the country, the idea of reaching adulthood without the skill seems completely foreign to me. But I guess growing up and living in a large city with a good public transport system, it's not strictly necessary to get through life. Uh, But I digress. The two of them were driving down Parramatta Road in Sydney, which is a notoriously busy main road that connects the inner western suburbs to the city centre. Some way into their trip, his wife started to merge lanes but hadn't properly checked her blind spots and had completely missed the truck coming up behind them at speed in the next lane. My friend started shouting at her, stop, stop, stop. She swerved back into her lane and after the truck passed, she immediately pulled over to the side of the road and started uncontrollably sobbing. Trying to console her, my friend started profusely apologising and saying he was sorry for upsetting her. However, he was suddenly struck with an epiphany. Why am I the one apologising here? If it weren't for my shouting, she would have gotten us both killed. Now, he's a smart guy with a PhD in psychology. He can look at the situation with 2020 hindsight and rationally recognise exactly what was going on there. But in the moment, he was biologically compelled to console his emotionally distraught wife up to and including admission of fault on his part, independent of the situation that had actually led them there. Even though she had royally screwed up, for some reason, he was the one apologising to her. Barbarossa and Girl Rights Watt have both touched on this before. There are some objective biological differences between men and women when it comes to crying. This is an article from the Wall Street Journal titled, Read It and Weep, Crybabies, Tears of Men and Women Are Different, Why It Can Be Hard to Avoid Choking Up. It's kind of lengthy, so the link is in the low bar if you want to read the whole thing. I just want to rattle off a few key paragraphs that are relevant to the subject of this video. Quote, Women are biologically wired to shed tears more than men. Under a microscope, cells of female tear glands look different than men's. Also, the male tear duct is larger than the female's, so if a man and a woman both tear up, the woman's tears will spill onto her cheeks quicker. One hormone in tears is prolactin, a lactation catalyst. Just as it helps to produce milk, prolactin also aids in tear production. By the time women reach 18, they have 50 to 60% higher levels of prolactin in their bloodstream than men do. Research indicates that testosterone helps raise the threshold between emotional stimulus and the shedding of tears. However, despite the fact that when males get older, their testosterone levels decrease, apparently women under 45 are still 10 times as likely to cry at work as men 45 and older. The article also speculates about the possible cultural influences on the difference between men and women crying. In case you hadn't already guessed, my suspicion is that like the vast majority of these issues, the culture descriptively reflects the underlying biological imperative rather than prescriptively changing the behaviour in any meaningful way. That is, men biologically evolved to cry less than women, therefore men are culturally expected to cry less than women. But I digress, there are quite obviously objective, physiological and hormonal differences between the sexes here. In other words, to whatever degree culture may or may not exacerbate the issue, it is ultimately an issue of biology. So why these differences then? Well, that's a very simple question with a very simple answer. These kind of clearly evolved biological differences mean one thing. We only have to observe how crying women are treated today to conclude that crying was and is advantageous for spreading genes. Crying women get what they want. Men, and frankly other women, bend over backwards trying to give those crying women what they want. Crying and the emotional leverage that comes with it is an effective reproductive strategy for women. And trying to appease crying women with the prospect of future sexual access is an effective reproductive strategy for men. In a population over many thousands of generations, women who cry more and the men who reliably support those crying women pass on more of their genes. It's really quite simple. 
And this lopsided emotional leverage probably goes some way to explaining the significant in-group bias amongst women and out-group bias amongst men that has been observed in various studies. The far more complicated question, I think, is what happens when this kind of fixed biological imperative runs up against our artificial cultural institutions of codified ethics and jurisprudence? You have a man and a woman on trial for the same crime with the same body of evidence. It's all good and well that the letter of the law is written in completely gender-neutral language, but what if, external to that legal framework, the judge and juror's opinions are emotionally swayed by the fact that they are biologically wired to see a crying woman as the default victim? Despite a gender-neutral framework, if our innate biological biases are also at play in the courtroom, is it actually possible for men to have a fair trial compared to women when they are both being judged by a biologically and emotionally susceptible jury of their peers? Now, I'm absolutely against the death penalty. However, it does reveal some very interesting data. The reason I find the data interesting is that the death penalty is really an issue of sentencing. Legally speaking, the individual's guilt is no longer in question. Also, unlike incarceration, it's an easily quantifiable sentence. We don't have to correct the duration or chance of parole. You either get the death penalty or you don't. These are men and women actually convicted of exactly the same crime, but we see a sentencing disparity five times more lenient for women. Even though they account for 10% of all murderers, they account for only 2% of death row inmates. Furthermore, despite committing 35% of all intimate partner homicides, there's that one in three number which feminists don't like to admit exists, the disparity only increases, with females receiving a much more lenient sentence compared to their convicted male counterparts. In cases where the victim was a woman, the death sentence rate was 10.9%, seven times the rate where men were the victims at 1.5%. What I found most interesting of all, however, is this little line from the Business Insider article that even fewer women actually get executed. That line intrigued me, so I decided to find out the raw stats. Since 1976, when the death penalty was reinstated, a total of 1,389 murderers have been executed in the United States. Of those, only 15 were women. Based on that, women make up 1.08% of actual executions, only around half the convicted women that make up the 2.08% sentenced to death row. Apparently, even when convicted and sentenced, there doesn't seem to be any great urgency to carry out that sentence where women are concerned. I think it's worth reading one final quote from that Business Insider article by Death Penalty Information Centre Executive Director, Richard Dieter, quote, these 12 people, the jury, are asked to see if this person has any redeeming qualities, and they often see their own mother or wife or grandmother, not someone who will continue to be a threat to society, Dieter said. Jurors just see women differently than men, end quote. Our legal framework itself may in fact be gender neutral but the innate biological instincts of individual judges and jurors who carry out the function of that legal framework sure as shit aren't. This represents more than a small problem. Many moons ago, when I first discovered the online men's movement, one of the biggest names at the time was Man Woman Myth. Uh, he produced some truly amazing content. Uh, like others, he's since moved on to other things and has taken his channel down, but Certain parts of his legacy live on. The main overarching theme of man-woman myth's content was the incompatible nature of equal opportunity with equal outcomes. For instance, football has a set of rules that apply to both teams equally. It is an equal opportunity sport. However, it's not equal outcome. Everyone plays by the same rules, but the game tends to have a clear winner and a loser because some teams, due to a variety of factors such as their draft pick of players, team experience, competency of the coach, sponsorship backing, etc., are just objectively better at the game than others. 
What this means is that if you think it's discriminatory that the red team scores more points than the blue team and that a more egalitarian game should end in a draw, then the only way you can enforce that outcome is to unfairly skew the game in the blue team's favour. You'll have an equal outcome, but it comes at the expense of equal opportunity. It's no longer a fair or fun game to watch. That hypothetical sounds ridiculous, because it is, and the notion that similar equal pay outcomes should be forced onto a competitive and wildly variable job market have long since been debunked. The problem is that, unlike football or the employment market, the legal system isn't supposed to represent a zero-sum game of competitive meritocracy. It is supposed to be independent and objective, It's supposed to render fair and just outcomes between equal members of society based solely on the objective facts of the case through a system of due process, presumption of innocence, right to face an accuser, guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, etc. I think you could essentially distill the legal system down to laws and outcomes based on those laws. The question then becomes, what constitutes a fair legal system? As long as our biology is a factor in the courtroom, it seems as though fair laws will necessarily result in comparatively unfair outcomes between men and women. If we try to force legal outcomes for men and women committing the same crimes, we essentially need to offset our biological biases by somehow explicitly skewing the law in men's favour, not unlike Sharia law which holds that a man's testimony is equal to that of two women. This is quite obviously not a fair, equitable and impartial system of judgment either. What we have is a paradox. As long as inherent biological gender biases are a factor in the decision-making process of individuals, then fair laws and fair legal outcomes cannot possibly exist in the same system. And if one of these two core components of the legal system is necessarily unfair, then the legal system itself at least as I've defined it here, is necessarily unfair. It seems as though we cannot have a fair and just legal system. Forgetting that going your own way is a solution in and of itself, it's often said that MGTOW highlight a lot of problems without ever offering viable solutions to people who still want to play the rat race. Getting down to the brass tacks of the issue, however, the real question is, What, pray tell, is the plan to fix our innate reproductive biology? It is, after all, at the very core of who and what we are. The boilerplate response seems to be raising awareness, but even a cursory glance at other societal problem areas with biological causes show us that it's just not that simple. Everyone is aware that obesity is a problem. Even obese people don't want to be obese. And yet societal rates of obesity continue to rise, with a projected estimate of 50% of the US population being obese by 2030. I, I see the appeal in this notion that people can be logicked out of their own biology, an appeal to rationality, make them aware. You know, it's certainly compelling because it not only placates the popular belief in free will, but simultaneously gives a rather satisfying target to blame for failures. I'm I'm sure it feels good to, you know, raise awareness by lambasting some disgustingly fat shit who's destroying your glorious society because he just doesn't have the the self-control to stop shoveling fistfuls of chocolate cake into his filthy fucking face hole. You know, I I bet that fat, gluttonous creature is an anti-egalitarian too. If only we can raise his awareness by getting up in his fat, stupid, lazy face and telling him what a fucking racist, sexist cunt he is as well. That'll that'll surely change his biological proclivities and single-handedly save Western civilization. I know I'm being overly hyperbolic here, But I should make it clear that I'm actually not some la-la fat acceptance advocate. Obesity is bad for individuals and society as a whole. And the truth is, I wouldn't even necessarily be against this kind of approach as a potential solution if there was even a single shred of evidence that it worked. 
Studies have shown that even when obese people do work hard and manage to lose significant weight, that is 10% or more of their original body mass, only 20% of those individuals are able to maintain that weight loss over an extended period of 12 months. Even amongst those who actively attempt to curb their weight problems, very few actually succeed. And we see these exact same failed results with similar approaches to other areas of human instinct, like abstinence-only education, which attempts to pit awareness-raising and God-fearing against raging, irrational teenage hormones. In medical terms, this is about efficacy versus effectiveness. You can blame it on the fat, stupid patients not following your precious medical protocols until you're blue in the face. But the fact remains that it's just not an effective treatment in the real world. Abstinence might be 100% efficacious on paper. After all, if you don't fuck, you don't get pregnant or catch STDs. In the real world, however, it's just not effective. Areas in the US which teach abstinence-only education show consistently higher rates of teen pregnancy and STDs. So whether you call it biological determinism or you dance around the issue insisting that it be called a, a failure of free will and personal choice on such a consistently large scale as to be confused with biological determinism, it doesn't really matter because the empirical data remains the same. Awareness raising, education, peer pressure and sheer willpower is not sufficient to curb these kind of biologically driven problems at the societal level. And it appears that the biological biases responsible for this legal disparity are just as deep. You see, this disparity is not institutional. It's not a problem with the legal system itself. It's not because of a law that can simply be rewritten. This is a problem with us. This is ultimately a problem of men who are biologically compelled to apologise to their crying wives even though they did nothing wrong.